Emma and I talk about this a lot, about accountability and about holding yourself to the highest standard that you can. And I think that it's, it's something that's very overlooked in training by a lot of athletes at, of, at all levels. And um, we always try to hold ourselves to the highest standard in training because then we know when we get to competition, like I said earlier, like there's not going to be any shock. Just a quick one. If you could do me a favour and please can you subscribe or hit the follow button wherever you listen to this podcast, we would appreciate that a lot. Enjoy. Today we have someone whom I think is a very, very understated person. He very much works hard in the shadows a lot and not just for himself, but for his other half and his athletes as a coach as well. He's a JST coach, he's a two times CrossFit Games athlete and I'd like to welcome David Shrunke to the podcast. Hello. <laughs> that, was a, uh, that was a, a very nice introduction. <laughs> I thought you were talking about me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> So you're in Wigan with, with us, David, are you? Yeah, here for the for a week, um, training here at the, the High Performance Centre in um, at Wigan uh, with the uh, the resident athletes and, and you guys and Steve. Yeah. Good. Uh, so was is it was this a spontaneous kind of trip? What? Yeah. Um, um, I think since you since you guys have got this place up and running, it was it was always going to happen. <laughs> but uh, after we all uh, met in Miami for what a loser. And we had a great time joining everyone on the, their Waterpalooza prep. Um, we thought it was it would be good to get it in sooner yeah. than later. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of start things off with going quite far back. Way back. Uh, way back. Um, just to kind of where, like the environment you were kind of brought in, brought up in when you were young, younger. What was it like in the Shrunky household? Were you, you know, sporty family? You know, what was what was life like? So you were. Brought up in South West London, weren't you? Is that I, right? I was actually brought up in East London. So right, I grew okay. Up in, uh, uh, we were like pretty much between Islington and Hackney. Right. Um, but I went to school in uh, in South West London. Okay. I actually I actually went to school um, for the first three years of secondary school. I went to City of London School for Boys, right. which was uh, the second ranked uh, private school in the UK. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, right. This does explain a few things, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the good t- the the pronunciation of T's. Yeah, yeah. So I went there for, for the for the, uh, for the first three years of so secondary school, and um, I'd gone to school uh, like primary school in East London, and all of my friends were there, and I played basketball a little bit before this as well. So the culture that I grew up in was very different to when I got to this school. Mm-hmm. And everyone there, I, I fortunately, fortunately enough, was able to get, my dad worked hard to, to, to get us a, um, get me a bursary that then funded the, the school fees. Right. And um, everyone else's, or like majority of the other, the, uh, my uh, classmates were from very wealthy families um, and had a very different upbringing to me. So it was a very, um, it was just very difficult going to school there because everyone was so different. Mm-hmm. And that was actually the reason why I ended up leaving after uh, three years, um, because my behavior was not good. Okay. And in hindsight, I didn't know that at the time, but it was, ju- it was basically just like, I think there was so much, the difference in like culture and behavior between me and everyone else was what? So what, what was the difference? Like what was the <coughs> difference to, you know, where you lived in South East London to then going into, um, you know, the city of London school, like how how was it? Um, well, in a in in one way to look at it is there was in in a, a sc- in a year of I think it was about one hundred and twenty boys, there were uh, seven of us that were not uh, white or Asian. Okay, okay. and um, their upbringing was largely they were from like middle class families. They came from like big homes, like a lot of money behind them. They had never like need wanted for anything. Yeah. There was very little kind of, um, especially at that age, appreciation for what they had, and kind of a feeling of that. Like yeah, I could work hard, but if I don't work hard, it's okay because, like, 
Monday, 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 Yeah. Whereas for us, it was very much the opposite. Like we'd had to work hard for everything that we got. And we knew that this was um, like a big opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, at that age, like that still doesn't outweigh the, the, like, the, the behavioral changes that occur when you just don't feel comfortable in, in, in a class. Yeah. And so do you, would you say that your behavior, like how did it affect your behavior day to day at school when you were there? Like, did I you think kind it just, of... Yeah, I think it just became like a bit rebellious. Yeah. And a bit like I, I didn't feel comfortable and didn't know how to like, express that, and so it ended up just coming out in in not behaving yeah. well, not I mean, paying what, attention. Between eleven and fourteen years, were you then yeah, fifteen. Yeah, like that. Yeah. People don't know their emotions when they're twenty yeah. odd years old. Never mind eleven to fourteen. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that would be a hard like, emotional thing to try and have to figure out yourself at that age. Mm. So, so what did you do after you dropped out of from that? So. <clears throat> After they um, they withdrew the bursary, so we, and we weren't able to like afford the, the school fees, um, but they had connections with a school that was in uh, South London in, in Tooting Broadway, Graveney School, and um, so I went there for the remainder of the the second my my secondary school years, and that was like infinitely better. I would say like academically, I performed way better at that school, despite potentially having like a lower quality of education or yeah. like teaching than I did at the previous school, just because I was surrounded by much more diversity and more people that I could like, associate with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, so what was the reason for you going to the City of London school then, was because of your it was just academics a, in primary school? It was just a really good school, and um, I can't remember what the, is it SATs that you take at the end yeah. of yeah. the primary you know, school? Yeah, so there was like yeah, a, yeah. there's a requirement for that, and like my, uh, my, um, my dad's Nigerian, and Nigerians are very, very big on education. Yeah, okay. And so for him, like before we even, like, well, I remember being in a primary school and <laughs> whatever, it's key stages, isn't it? When you're yeah. yeah. And I remember being like, if I, when I'm, we were, I was at like key stage one in the morning before I went to school, um, my dad had printed off these like uh, exam papers for the key stage above. <laughs> so like, I would, we would get up early, and my, he did this with my sister as well, and like, we'd have breakfast and then between breakfast and going to school, we would sit and we would do the exam papers for the key stage above our year. <laughs> Um, and then we would go to school, and so I'd be doing like key stage two exam papers, but you just and then we and then we go to school and do key stage one, <laughs> which of course then meant that we go uh, every year we were just sat there like so bored, and then we'd start causing problems because of that as well. But um, I ended up doing very well because of that, and he was very big on education, so for for him it was very important. I went to like the the best possible school. So how did he feel when you dropped out? Of oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for a short period of time, life was not worth living. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, he was very, very disappointed and very... Um, <clears throat> maybe disappointed is the, is the wrong word. Maybe it was more... He, he was just... Yeah, just a bit, a bit angry, a bit disappointed at, at the... Because for him, I had squandered this opportunity mm -hmm. for... A reason that he didn't see was was valid like just like yeah. behavior is something that you're in control of but I think over time he's also realized that the like the 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 social like cultural change was too much at that age yeah. Yeah. for me to adjust to and that actually um, it was better to be in a potentially like a, a worse environment and but, but that was that I could associate with than a better one with all the opportunities that I didn't that I could remake the most of. Yeah. Um, it's funny actually when you mentioned then about your dad and making him, making him, him making you do the key stage above <laughs> exams. Yeah. And then also kind of like, maybe call it the expectation he had on you to you know, go through it, you know, succeed at the City of London School. How much do you feel like you carry that on through in your training currently? Because <laughs> I see some pretty big um, similarities myself looking in and on, hearing that story and then looking at you as a tra training and as an athlete. Do you yeah. feel like, or have you not thought about that? You know what, until, until we've spoken about this now, I've never actually associated those two things. Yeah. No. Because I feel like, so, so the similarity between the key stage um, situation where you do the exams higher, to me when, you, when I watch you training, training is, also, is always, 
you're always trying to replicate the hardest variation of what a competition could be, if that makes sense. An example, just this morning, I came in and I was, we, we had an e a 40 minute imam of um, minute one, cow bike, minute two, burpee, jump overs, box jump overs, minute three, cow row, minute four, rest. And because there was girls and boys, we were swapping, the, turning the box over between, uh, you know, between the sets. <coughs> And I went to turn your box over to put it to 24 to help you out. And you shouted, no, leave it at 20. Because you wanted to do the flip to go into your burpee box jump. Mm. Like you would have to do when you're in a company. Now, you didn't have to do that in the training session. Mm. Because you, it would. I mean, I was just helping things out, make it convenient for you. But straight away, you saw that I was going to make things easier. And was like, boom, no. I want to do that because that will prepare me mm. for competition. Exactly. And it's very that to me that's the same kind of approach as the key stage exams. Is that something like is that, yeah. the, is that the first time you think you've? That's the first time I've associated those two things. But you know, when uh, I've always thought that that's just the, I've always taken credit for that approach myself. But clearly, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of yeah. 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 It? But I've never. Yeah, a lot of your characteristics are kind of like quite early set, aren't they? Yeah. But maybe that is one of the. Maybe that is one of the things, is that I suppose the the the, the popular quote is uh, "train hard, fight easy," isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if you make it difficult in training, there's nothing that can surprise you in competition because you're ready for the hardest standard. Yeah. And if it is the hardest standard, the strictest standards, you're like, oh well, it's just like training. Yeah. And if it's easier, then it's a bonus. Yeah. Whereas if it's the other way around, you're like more it's often in for a, 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 like a nasty surprise. You lose that control a little bit, don't you? Because yeah, you know, it's the shock and it's the potential panic that comes from oh, and then you don't feel like you're in control of the situation because you've never been at that situation before. Mm. Whereas the stuff that you do, you you're beyond that situation. So dropping back to the standards at competition is mm. just like oh, this is gonna be mm. comfortable with this situation, comfortable with this environment because I trained. Mm. But it's just like that, which was just one example of the forty minute imam, but regular occurrences in every day's training I'd say where you do similar similar kind of things similar approaches um, yeah and then the what how your dad said I was his, his expectations of you when you're at the city of London mm. I would also say that you hold high expectations of you not only yourself but you like Emma for example mm. and your training partners around you and mm. if they're not holding the expectations that you set in your head like I feel like it also then like what the right word is but like a bit it of aggravates like you yeah, like yeah, it annoys yeah. you it's yeah. like hmm yeah. and again that's kind of shows to what you explained then about your dad getting you to the you know, potentially what was it the second highest academic school in the country mm. and then you not sitting the whole thing through I feel like again you got the a little bit of a uh, a bit of a carryover from that to now. Papa shrunk. <laughs> yeah, Come I on. think it's a it's um. <clears throat>
other people's standards to, to, or you don't see how, like, to what standards other people perform. So when you're doing workouts and you're sharing scores online, like we have the, the white ball workout or we have uh, like any other workouts, like qualify workouts, for instance, like they're not so like uh, strict with the standards. Um, you can, uh, and someone gets a better time than you or you're like comparing times. It's kind of difficult to do sometimes because yeah. you can't guarantee that other people have done it to that same strict standard. Mm -hmm. So then you start, it can be if you if you're not aware of it, start to sow those seeds of doubt in your mind as yeah. to how fit you really are if other people are doing better than you in those online like workouts. That's one thing for me. Um, we are, we are, all us on on this side. You know, when when you're back over in in Sweden, and we see, like even if you post your score. Mm. We will straight away we go, yeah, like maybe he's a min yeah, maybe a minute behind Reggie, but we know that you've done advanced bar every X amount of steps. <laughs> like everything's been set up like a competition. So I don't know if it, you know, other people think that, but I think that's just that's potentially a little little secret there that you know let these people go faster in competi in training and be shocked because you 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 do comparatively perform better in competition yeah. than. Um, training or qualifiers where there isn't set set up instructions like you can put a box and a yeah. bar and a pull up bar yeah. anywhere yeah um, but yeah I can see where if you kind of lose that kind of perspective of oh well they put all of their equipment within this two meter square yeah, radius yeah. and yeah. I did it over ten meters yeah and especially when it's coming up to competition season and you're starting to get a little bit mm. um, more conscious of the level of performance mm. that you're putting in. It's just important to keep in mind that like what counts is what you do, is what happens in competition. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and that's the other downside of it as well, is that we found that sometimes it gets to competition and like how you, um, how you train is like, uh, like the best, like how you perform naturally. So sometimes you can get to competition if the standard is a little easier and you're used to performing it a little stricter, it can, al it can almost be just as hard to adjust it down yeah. to, you, to what feels like cheat reps, but, or not necessarily cheat reps, but just like not as strict as the ones we were doing. And so then we potentially lose time because of that, because we're not used to putting our hands like wider, like in a wider box on a strict handstand push up, or yeah. we're not used to like doing a, a D ball two shoulder or like lower than the shoulder because that's like the judges aren't calling it that kind of thing so you can always shoot yourself in the foot with that too but i suppose it's uh, we would still prefer to go to the stricter standard and bring yeah. it easier it does also explain um like yesterday how we strict handstand push-up you know what i mean uh sorry was, like, was it yesterday it was yesterday on monday oh yeah monday yeah like yeah. doing it too strict and like you say yeah. like, take advantage of that like you it doesn't have to be perfect you can arch yeah, yeah. you can look up at the mat yeah and if that gets you more reps then yeah yeah and i think it explains i mean i'm sure you spoke you've spoken thought about last season enough but it explains further why you'd get you get frustrated with the um the lack of high standards that some competitions hold mm. um if you hold yourself to a high standard every training session and the competition itself then isn't held to a high standard um like with the you know the penalties that people have received at semi-finals and then some people did receive it some people didn't mm. and the same when you're at a competition i guess it's just the level that crossfit as a sport is currently at every year we keep saying it but it's still a young it's still a young sport yeah. where there's not the, the judges aren't paid to judge mm. so it's like where you feel a bit of a a dick by saying to the like making a kicking up a fuss about the judge who's doing it as a volunteer but then at the same time it's on the competition to make sure that this competition that's got hundreds of thousands of pounds of prize money yeah is holding the, the high standards that would make a legit competition mm. um, but yeah if there's someone if you're holding yourself to those standards in training day to day guess that makes the frustrations even bigger at competition when it's I think it's uh we'll probably get back to this when we get to like move up to competition but it it's uh I think it's more like the consistency of judging as well yeah like the the standard if the standard is set then you like you know where you're at 
but if the if some athletes are getting judged in one way and, and other athletes are getting judged in another, I think that's the most frustrating thing is yeah. the lack of consistency. But like you said, that would come from educating the judges and also and, and probably paying the judges as well. Yeah. Especially when yeah, so much prize money's on the line. Yeah. And it's yeah, it's people's lives and careers, isn't it? It can change mm. your life that amount of money. Mm. Um, <clears throat> just going on from moving schools, did you feel pressure then from your family when you went to Graveney School or anything like that? Or did you feel like in that environment you were in at the new school, like because it kind of just fitted what you were probably used to in South East London? Did you feel like it, you just kind of... Yeah, I think maybe I did feel a pressure initially to, to like, because when you're that young, you are like you believe like basically everything your your parents tell you. <laughs> so like to me, it was like okay, I'm gonna have to work it, to succeed from this school is gonna be um, like digging myself out of a hole. This is gonna be really hard. So I'm gonna have to really focus and work hard now because like I've pissed away this opportunity. I'm doomed to fail, and like I and uh, or I'm I'm almost doomed to fail. I'm gonna have to work really hard now, but. And in, in, actually, I think once I got there, I felt way more relaxed and um, I felt m much more comfortable in that environment. So I felt like it was going to be easier to, to mm -hmm. succeed there or, or to do well enough anyway. Yeah, because obviously coming to any competition that you've done, you know, over the years, I feel like pretty much most of them, you've always been on the podium. Yeah. And I feel, I've always seen you as someone that handles pressure very well um when it kind of you know really really matters at mm. competition um so i was just wondering it where you know was that pressure like i say when you're younger when you were when it was put on you uh you know where where does that kind of come from is what <laughs> yeah living, living in, a, in a household with yeah. a nigerian dad it's just day every day is pressure to put <laughs> is it, so like, is know, it it's just is that... going to competition is just another day <laughs> <laughs> Uh, possibly, Should yeah. Train hard, when it, if, uh, compete easy, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> live hard and then... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I suppose maybe that is, yeah. Maybe that is like a little bit, just living with a little bit of expectation to perform. Mm -hmm. And then you get, you... I mean, it's hard to... How do you divide the effect of that to the, from the effect of just like all the sports like, that you've done through the years? Yeah. yeah. So the next thing I want to come on to as well is the environment. So what I mean by that is you, after uni, went to Cheltenham. Yeah. And then you had the opportunity to go to Nordic. Yeah. Um, and now you've decided you were staying in Sweden, you went to Vichy, and now you're currently at Karlstad. Um, over the years, like, what have you found from the different training environments as kind of worked and benefited you as a, as a person and, a, and an athlete? Like, what have you gained from training partners? You know, it's quite a broad question. But like, what, what do I feel like are the characteristics of like the ideal training environment for, yeah. for us? Um, <clears throat> I think um, I definitely prefer and um, feel like I've, I've had I've, we've been able to create somewhat like an environment where we are um, like we just like a professional environment mm -hmm. like an environment where and and by environment like I'm guessing like you mean that like training partners and other people that we are training with as well like like you said before the culture so, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so at every box pretty much that I've trained at um, uh, since starting the sport, including the sport, including the box that we're at now, mm -hmm. it's just been like a regular box uh, with members, and um, we are doing our training in that box. Um, and I over the years, I've um, learnt how to create that, um, like almost like a bubble that we train within, where we create like that yeah. intensity and, and focus on the training, but it still operates within like the, the regular gym. Yeah. Uh, with everyone else as well um, so coming here is really nice because it's not that bubble is basically like the whole gym yeah. mm -hmm. so like you're not you're not having to um, like fight off distractions or 
like ignore people talking to you, like right next to you or um, like walking in front of you when you're lifting or having to like pause your session to like negotiate for space for, for like your next workout. It's just like, we just get on with it, which is yeah. really nice. But usually day to day, that's what it's like. And um, I suppose over, over time, the environment, uh, like making it a more ideal environment has actually been a case of learning how, to, how do we operate within a CrossFit box better so that we can keep that ideal environment with ourselves, like my, me, Emma and I, um, whilst other people are still getting on with their training as well. Yeah. We do also have like some more stuff at, um, at home as well, like some uh, the machines at home. So and that's really nice because then it's just us, it's the machines. Get some music on, and, and that's a nice environment. Yeah. Of a good, a good question that you asked a couple of weeks ago, I think it was to you. Well, you asked it to yourself, but you shared it with a group. Was from your training partners over the years. Yeah. What's been like a really good characteristic from each training partner you've had that has really brought, you know, like a, a good addition to the table. So yeah. like what's Will brought to the table when you were at Cheltenham and then what's Simon brought to the table yeah. when you were, you know, in, at Nordic. Yeah, yeah. And then what does Emma bring yeah. to the table that, yeah. like what what is it you've got from the training partners over the years? So with um, with Will, Will was probably <clears throat> my first like proper training partner because I've been doing CrossFit for only a few months before I met Will. Um, and I think, Will was the first person that I trained with that had done CrossFit for a long time. And as I said, my first training partner within CrossFit. So I didn't really have any idea of like what athletes in the sport were like. Mm -hmm. um, but he, when I started training with Will, um, the gap between us was, was quite large. And then over time, that gap like closed gradually. Um, and so, and I learned a lot of things from Will like just generally with training because like, I didn't know anything about CrossFit training much then. Um, but I think that one of the things that I, I picked up from him was the, the, uh, the benefit of like, of, or the value of consistency and um, the value of like showing up every day and putting in the work. Um, but also uh, he was quite good at like, adjusting training to how he feels as well. And so like highlighting like the importance of um, that like yeah you want to follow the program and like if the ideal would be that you were fit and healthy enough to follow the program every day and the other lifestyle factors wouldn't influence your training at all and so you could but then also register in that if something doesn't feel good the potential negative effect of forcing your way through that part of the training outweighs the like downside of missing that bit out in the long run yeah if it means that you're like it, you you get more training done afterwards yeah um uh simon i think simon has been uh, a, a, a big influence on like the professional side of it because he does approach his training sessions like very methodically like he's got a plan for like what he's going to do the reason why he's going to do it and how he's gonna approach the workout. Um, and he also brings quite a bit of intensity to the session and not to intensity in terms of like hype, but like just sheer focus as yeah. well. Um, and I don't get to train to Simon so much anymore, but whenever we do, like there is that, it's not that like loud, shouty intensity, it's just that like quiet, focused, like ang yeah. internal anger uh, <laughs> <laughs> intensity. Um, yeah, and he's like that. That's been. I, mean, I always think about training sessions like that with with Simon. Very focused, very intense, and like very professional. Um, and it's also like when we, when, especially when we're doing lifting as well. Like the, when you you get in that kind of like zone with someone where you don't you don't need to talk. It's just like bang, bang, yeah. bang. You need to look at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they understand. Yeah. yeah. Like handy little things as well, like when you're approaching like a max weight or like, like a heavy load or like what would be like a, a near PB or a PB, you don't need to you don't need to say anything, like they just, just know they just know, and they know what to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Emma, oh, useless. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't learned anything. No, um, Emma is uh, without a doubt the most. Um, like mentally the strongest athlete I've ever met. 
like I don't know what's what between her ear is filled between her ears, but it's like some seriously strong stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the the biggest thing that I've that I've picked up, I've lot picked up loads of things from Emma, but um, especially because we've come from such different sporting ba backgrounds, um, her with swimming and me with basketball. Um, but the um, I think the biggest thing that I've picked up from her is. Uh, a kind of self-belief in what her body can do and also the value of just trying to get to, of um, almost sounds a little bit in, in contrast of will but maybe it's a bit more like a balance of it if, if Emma's not feeling if, if Emma's not feeling good and she's not feeling like she can do a session um, instead of just scrapping the session uh, or replacing it with something else she'll do the session to the best of her ability yeah. and she will register that even though she hasn't been able to do that session the best that she could possibly have done it she still is going to get some value Better out of doing it the best she can on that day and that if you think and that doesn't sound like a very big thing but if like say one or two sessions a week you feel like terrible maybe because of like whatever like other lifestyle factors affected you like poor sleep or you haven't been able to eat what you need to eat whatever um you can't you don't want to do this session and you've got the option of not doing the session and resting, which may in some circumstances be like a, a good thing to do. But more often than not, you can do that session. Yeah. You just do it at like a slightly lower intensity and you still get something out of that. Yeah. You do that one or two sessions a week and then you add that up over how many weeks in a year. That has a huge impact on your overall development. As well as like mentally knowing that you've been able to like keep the consistency going over like days and weeks and months. Yeah. She's very good at that. I was just thinking, um, we would, we just spoke about this just before we started the, the podcast. Um, Emma, like you say, was a, an ex-national level swimmer. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, in Sweden. Swedish national. Obviously, in, in swimming, you're on, you, you ha actually have a lane, so you're always physically staying, in, like literally staying in your own lane. Yeah. Um, and then... No, it just that could potentially then transfer into a, a life and a training in CrossFit of then um, metaphorically staying in your own lane. Do you think that has you know that's the reason, or do you think uh, knowing Emma and p her potential upbringing has made like that? Is it a mixture of both? Do you think? Um, what kind of makes what do you think makes her have that such disciplined attitude? Um. She's very, um, I don't want to say stubborn, it sounds negative. Yeah, but like stubborn that kind of, but maybe, yeah, yeah, stubborn, yeah. yeah. She's stubborn in, in a way that like if, like she will do it. Yeah. yeah. And, she, and it carries over to like, to in, in training with like learning skills as well. Like she will, she will learn it. She'll get, she'll, she'll fail like over and over and over again, but she'll, she will keep going until she gets yeah. it to the point where maybe even sometimes it's, it gets like it, she's like overtrained the skill and it's <laughs> yeah. going downhill. I have to say to like enough, like it would, you're done. We'll you're just now try again tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that is uh, also, there's so many good parts of that because it doesn't matter how terrible she feels. She will get value out of that session. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's one thing to like do the session at a lower intensity or change or like reduce the reps or the weight or whatever it is and do it but to also the the difficult thing then after that is to also believe that you got value out of that session because i know a lot of us i i definitely feel like if i don't do the session as is written part of me is like i might as well have not done the session at all like mm -hmm. it was a waste of time whereas she'll register that like no that's still a stimulus there mm -hmm. like you still your body yeah. still has some adaptation because if if it was it's not too easy because if it was you'd be able to do the full thing so you're still going to get something out of that, yeah. And um, the nature of swimming as well, like it's very grueling training, like oh. long hours, high volume, <laughs> like early morning starts, and all in water as well. And all like, in water. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention, like you, you can't even you can't even breathe when you're. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she also um, has had asthma since she was uh, a child as well. So I think she's had quite a bit of adversity of her own to to yeah. deal with that has like hardened her over time yeah it's uh it's interesting so like both of you there have kind of like got different minds i mean fran speak about this 
quite a bit. There's, oh, yeah. there's the there's the emotional mind that takes in kind of like feelings, like your own feelings, other people's feelings, and just kind of like the environment and just takes in all this these different pieces of information from either yourself or other people um, to help make your decision on the action that you're going to make. And then there's the other one where it's like, it's about, f it's facts. We're not really bothered about emotions and feelings. It's just like hard facts. Like we just think, think really literally. And it's just like more yes or no, that kind of attitude. Mm. And then there's the middle, which is what they call like the smart mind, yeah. which is a mixture of both and having both at the right time. Yeah. Um, what I can kind of see a little bit there is I'm not saying that you're like way over on that side and also I'm not saying that Emma is way over on that side, but you've both kind of got to the point where you've you've helped mm -hmm. each other come into the middle. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. And I feel like as a CrossFit competitor with the demands of the sport, how sometimes it can be so monotonous, just like head down, not think of anything and go. And then at other times you have to be taking on information about everything to do with the event. It might be a really high skill workout. You know, you might have to take notice of where you are within the within your heat of people. Mm. You have to be able to go switch between the two and be that smart mind where sometimes you lean <coughs> further towards like one side and sometimes you lean further towards the other rather than just being stuck. This is who I am. I don't change. Yeah. Then sometimes having great moments and sometimes having bad moments mm. and vice versa if you're Mm. Um, the other side so that's yeah it's interesting that you're both I uh, I thought you were more closer towards Emma side and then you both come that way but listening to you speak then I feel like you both come from opposite side and brought each other which side did you feel like we were at before um, Emma be well I have to say that you're both more the black and white yes facts, or no yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the facts just literal but hearing kind of you explain the things then and then thinking back to a few conversations we've had I'd probably put you more over to the other side mm. Mm. Um, and then you've actually just merged both towards the middle would you agree or yeah I, th I think that uh, something that we've um, become much much better at over time which has been really helpful in like in training like in, in life as well but especially within training is that like you say like you're you want to be in the middle but depending on how like different things that are happening you could be pushed like more over to one edge one side or another yeah and i think we've been over time we've we've learned to how to help each other stay in the middle mm -hmm. so sometimes we talk about like the emotional side we talk about like you just like getting in your feels yeah. too much yeah yeah and then the other side is potentially like not not registering like feels. your feels enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like sometimes usually one of us, if one of us is in the feels too much, yeah. the other one will recognize that. Yeah. And will say like it, it, it can just be a little bit like, are you just being are you just in the feels a bit too yeah, much? Yeah, and then yeah. you're like, yeah, I am actually just being in the feels a bit too much. And it's yeah. just like I think that's off. that whole concept what we've talked about there is the reason why you both, you know, you're a couple, you live together, you spend pretty much every minute of every day mm. around each other yet still competing at the highest level in the sport I feel like you have I feel like as a as a team of two you have to be able to do what you yeah, just yeah, said absolutely. And absolutely I feel like yeah. if you're not it, you're just gonna you make each other's performance worse yeah in training and competition yeah. and it's it's not easy as well like it takes time to learn mm -hmm. like it takes time to recognize like the characteristics of your partner when they are in those moments yeah and then it takes time to learn like what works for them to bring them out of it yeah because like, i have times especially with like the past season like struggling with injury where i just i like have a hissy fit and i'm like oh this i don't want to do this training oh, yeah, like, yeah. This, um, and and she then knows what to say like she knows to explain to me like however frustrated you are with what you can't do, you know that there's something else that you can do instead yep. that's gonna get you value out of that session. Yeah. And I will like as much as no, I will. Just right again. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, and, and the same as well for her, like in training with, or, or in competition, like helping her put 
like not get in the fields too much and uh, and stick to like the facts and remember the training and remember what she's what she's done and like the foundation that she's built and yeah. yeah. It's interesting because there's obviously I think you've kind of like you've gone you go I go seasons I feel like for the last yeah. couple of years. <laughs> yeah, we spoke about that. Yeah. Um, Eventually we're gonna end up going at the same time. Hopefully. Yeah. This is the year. Um, Emma's had seasons where she's also had uh, she had like a wrist um, yeah. issue, didn't she? And yeah. Where you know, just like just a natural thing for any athlete, you just you just get frustrated and um, like a, an injury is potentially a hole in your back and your emotions and your feels do come out. And I feel like then you were that other person that was just like kept yeah. her on track. Yeah. Um, so it's good that you can both flip flip it round to suit each other. Do you feel like you could both have achieved what you've achieved? without each other? Mm. Or could you have achieved more each? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <maybe. laughs> no. Um, no. I don't no. feel like I could have achieved what I've done without Fran being the kind of the counterbalance for me as well yeah yeah no i don't think so because like the it's um it, it's one thing to it's one thing to be able to like support your partner to do what they love to do but it's another it's another thing to to also be in, in a position with the like the knowledge as well and the experience to like facilitate it so that you're helping them get better yeah as well and i think that it's uh it's very rare to to find that, yeah. and to also like learn that, like as you've just said about like the balance as well yeah. between the two. Because I, I would say I, I would be the very I would be the Emma I would be very I'm a literal person. Yeah. Just kind of like yes or no, like don't give me a cryptic clue because I'm yeah. probably not going to figure it out. I can yeah. just, like, yes or no, and Fran is very much the opposite side. Could yeah. walk in a room and sense exactly how everyone's feeling like yeah. instantly yeah. and want to correct want to correct that if they can if she can sense that someone's not feeling great in a room she'll go over and talk to that person to, yeah, yeah. to yeah. equal like yeah. a quite equal, equal equilibrium in that room um but then together we've kind of again found found this middle space yeah to be smart yeah and that's it and then that's you can help each other stay like within that middle space as yeah. well yeah. yeah and because it comes from someone that you like that you love and respect so much you um, you value what they're yeah. saying as well, so it has way more of an effect on you than than, than anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Seizing opportunities and having the courage to do it. So, you said before, you'd only been doing CrossFit a couple of months, and then you ended up at Cheltenham. Yeah. And then you had the opportunity again to go to Nordic. Mm -hmm. Seize the opportunity to go there. Which again, like moving countries, different language takes you know courage to do. Um, now we've got the opportunity to come to Wigan. Then. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got the opportunity to come back. Yeah, <laughs> you've had your fun. Get back home. <laughs> um, uh, so coming, yeah, coming back to the opportunities um, and seizing the opportunities, uh, like. What has given you the confidence to be able to, like, just go ahead and and do that? You know what? I'm not gonna lie. I don't. I don't do that at all. Oh really? <laughs> it's the other people around me. That's right. Okay. Me. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I am. Uh, I I hate travelling. Right. And I've always hated travelling. Okay. And uh, when I was in England, I hated travelling. The idea of like, <laughs> I I vividly remember getting a message from Bjork asking, um, uh, like, saying about this is what we're doing in Nordic. Would you like to? Would you like to? come over and, and join us be part of the team and uh, I remember um, uh, telling like friends and family like it like it was a joke like oh, like, like I'm gonna go to Sweden like to me it was like not even an option like, I've never <laughs> even considered moving <laughs> and their response almost everyone's response was like why is that why would that be a joke like why is it why would you not do it like yeah. you'll never you, you, yeah. you don't know if you'll ever get that opportunity again and I was, I was so happy and like comfortable and, mm. and like not comfortable even in a sense of like I'm not working hard 
comfortable in a sense of like I like my my flat and my like English home and life. Yeah. Like why would I want to change and go to 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 Sweden? And so it's actually it was them that like saying that, that you have to take this opportunity because if you don't, then you will regret it. And it's true because like they and, and the other thing was also that like uh, with the opportunities, most most of the opportunities that are put in front of you. If they don't work out, you can usually always return to somewhat of a similar yeah. situation that you mm -hmm. have now. So you really have nothing to lose. Um, but in terms of like that of moving to Sweden, I cannot take any credit for that. <laughs> I can only maybe I can take credit for selecting uh, good enough friends to like, encourage me to, <laughs> yeah, to do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but that was a that was a step that I I didn't even consider in the beginning, and then over time realised that like that, yeah this would be a very good opportunity. How was it adapting? Um, to Swe uh, Sweden, have, especially. We a whole other podcast. Yeah. Like, adapting to the Swedish lifestyle. Um, Swedes are very, uh, very. Uh, how can I say? Like they're much more introverted. Yeah. Than us in the UK, and like much less, uh, like I suppose, like sociable in a way, especially especially with someone who's who doesn't speak Swedish. Um, something that I heard recently was about like the difference in like the the Swedes versus the Americans and they said like it's the coconut versus the peach and so the Americans are this this was like their assessment of like of what people are like in, in either country and the Americans are the peach has like a like a, a stone of a certain size but mm. it's got quite a lot of flesh that's easy to get through so like to, to, to have like small talk with them and like friendly conversation is yeah. very easy to do from the start um, but it, you get quite a lot of that small talk and like easy chat before you really get to like the root of them mm. and then to get into that and form like a really meaningful uh, like relationship is much harder but you get a lot of that like small talk and nice bits at the top um, whereas Swedes a, a, like a coconut where it's based like it's hard on the outside like from the start like there is no very little small talk it's very hard to like form like a meaningful relationship yeah. but then once you get through that like that tough exterior like there's a lot like they're they're very friendly and they're very open and there's a lot of like meaningful yeah. relationship in there so that was a big difference coming from the UK to Sweden because there's just there's no shit chat <laughs> <laughs> such a good way to describe the two it is yeah. like cultures societies because i think the we're not quite country. like the americans it's probably like mm -hmm. a, i feel like it's a bit of a mix between the two maybe like an apple or something well there's no yeah and then just like tiny seeds yeah yeah core value at the beginning yeah. at the end <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was uh that was quite a big change the the i think that it's, people say scandinavians but when you live there you live that Swedes are not the same as Danes, which are, and they're not the same as the Finnish, they're not the same as the Norwegians. Like there's slight okay. differences between them, yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, that was a big change, cultural side. And that was the first time you went to the games as well, wasn't it? Yeah, that year with Team Nordic Opex. How how was it going team to the games for the first time? Compared to before you've been to regionals individually in 2014. Yeah. Um, then missed a year. Missed a year, yeah. Took a year off, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then went to the games with the team in 2016. What, what, um, so why did you take a year off after doing regionals and then like go into the games in 2016? So I think oh. I took the year off uh, after regionals because that was when the knee injury started becoming a, a, a real issue okay and that was an injury that i had like throughout basketball and, and, and other sports as well um, and that so i got through the regionals and then during the next season's training i think what probably happened was i'd realized i'd like found this new sport i realized i could be good at it i'd already have like some minor success going to regionals um and so i like just upped the ante with training too quickly didn't give the body like a chance to respond to like as the volume was increasing and so on and just pushed it too hard too soon and so then that forced me to like take a step back and miss out that season, um, but I did other like competitions throughout that season, just not the the game season. Um, and then competing on the team, it was um, the the thing that was really good about the team was that everybody and the team like manager understood the value of training together on a team, which I think a lot of teams overlook. Yeah. And I think uh, that really. Um, 
that really helped our performance was the fact that we did literally every single training session together. So you get to know your teammates very, very well. Yeah. And that was a really good experience on the team. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask on uh, that note, with your, with your knee. So what I looked at over the years is when you took a year off, the next year you you did something like pretty big. So you had a year off, you went to the games, and then before twenty you missed twenty nineteen twenty twenty nineteen was a longer off season. And then you went to the then you qualified for the games in twenty twenty. Yeah. After, so bouncing back from injuries, like Yeah. I feel like you're someone that's obviously been quite good at doing that compared to other people who may get injured and then just be like completely fall off the wagon. Yeah. Like, did you fall off the wagon initially, like with your knee or what? You know, how yeah. did you respond to that? I think it's, not, it's, it's nice that you, you, re you see that and you think... Um, that I've been someone who's been good at bouncing back from injuries mm -hmm. because I see it and I think uh, that I am someone who's constantly constantly been limited by the injury. Right, okay. And I would much rather have like not had the years out and I've, I would much rather have just been able to compete every season. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, maybe having the year out like forced or otherwise was beneficial for the subsequent year performance. I've, uh, it's happened actually, there's quite a lot of examples that you can give that about Lucas Hogberg being one who failed to make the games. Uh, what was the year that he did really well and podiumed? That oh, was 2018. 2000, is it? Yeah, 2019. Yeah, so he failed to make the games the year, the previous year. And then came on and the podium. And then podiumed yeah. at the games the following year. Yeah, yeah. And I remember there being an example from like Rasmus, and I'm sure Lauren Fisher. Um, there's quite a lot of examples if you go through where it's kind of been like, big year, Something's happened, stops them from being able to compete or do a full season that year. Following year, another big year, and it's kind of like gone year on, year off. Obviously, you have to some of the people like that manage to do it every single year, but I think because of the season length being what we are, end of February, it technically begins with the Open mm. all the way through until August. Let's yeah. call it September if you're having to have a bit of a, yeah. you know, a deload after. And then September you have some big competitions are right after that that you might also yeah. want to do. Try and earn some money with. Yeah. You've got a potential Fine, three right. month, three to four month gap there where you need to fix problems, whether it's a weakness, an injury, whatever it is you need to do before mm. you go it again next yeah. year. Three month to four months. Yeah. If we talk about any sports that are on the Olympic scene or like Commonwealth, like Commonwealths are every four, yeah. and they're in between the Olympics, so it's like Olympics, then two years later Commonwealth, two years later Olympics, so there's like that two year mm. gap in between, and most yeah. of those level, most of those athletes will peak for Commonwealth, but it won't be their like full peak, it'll always be at the Olympics when they're at that level. Mm. But Olympics will be the main peak. So this comes around to four years then, to iron out problems, get on top of injuries, lay the foundations where we've got four months yeah um i've said it a few times and i even ignored my own advice in 2016 so obviously made the game 2015 got injured 2016 at regionals and spent a good part of 2016 feeling like i had to catch up from mm -hmm. the time off that i had after the 2015 games so i felt like 2016 16 i was always on catch up mm -hmm. then got injured then went to the game, won regionals with the team the following year. What do you think? So, like, as a as a thing, we've spoke about it. You should just alternate years. Year one, you go individual, and it's mm. all about yourself, and iron out your weaknesses and competing for yourself. The next year, the focus competitively is team, but, and that kind of takes a little bit of pressure off and allows you to iron out some weaknesses and injuries and then the following year is individual again mm, okay. how would you think that would work for the general it's competitor or do you think just take that year out of competing completely 
it's difficult because there are some athletes that seem to be able to there are athletes that are able to compete consistently year after year but you know like that they are some some of them are like the best of the best and in any case they are the very small minority mm -hmm. of like the general crossfit population but the I, I definitely don't think that having a year where you are not focusing on competing as an individual between your years of competing is a bad idea at yeah. all Take Bjorgren for example, mm -hmm. someone who first game 2014, I think he came 26th, and then he, the following year he took third, mm -hmm. and then has kind of then been consistent between third and eighth, I think, kind of over the years. Yeah. Who's he's someone who's physically, mentally, he's got the capacity to win the games, I think anyway. But what he needs to work on which is the reason he hasn't competed through this off-season, is something that potentially needs more time than that four-month off-season to right. be able to win the game. Right. So you're saying that even though these people are performing at the highest level, Could they're, it be still not, yeah, they're still not performing to their full potential. Yeah. Because Could it, it yeah. be higher if yeah. he did take one of those years out? Yeah. I mean, for us, like, I'm definitely not performing on the same level as Bjorgen. Um, like, or like the like, games athletes from this past year. But um, but um, I already find it difficult to, to, to deal with that the like the volume and the intensity and like the sheer grind daily grind of training year after like year after year yeah. like when you're comes around soon well. yeah. comes around fast so like for them to be competing at that like for, at that level I think uh, yeah it's it's it could be an answer couldn't it to take the year off although I don't know if necessarily I don't necessarily. I'm not sure if taking the year to do team. Mm. I'm not sure it's if that's the same. Just yeah. it's the same demand. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same demand. I think it's more a case of same demand. I think maybe it's just a different demand, and maybe that different demand might not be in line with what you need to work on as an individual yeah. as well. Yeah. Do you think? Um, do you think it's just because people don't th think of it like that? I'm just going like year on year off. Or do you think it's kind of pressures from to be able to make this a career, get sponsorships, to be in the limelight year on year, to be able to get the sponsorship deal? I used to think it was going. a bit about the sponsorships, but now, like, like some of the people, like the best athletes have like brilliant sponsors, but there are plenty of athletes that don't perform to a very high level that have a lot of sponsorships, some serious sponsorship deals. Yeah. Um, so, I mean. I think it's clear that sponsors look for a big following and yeah. like engagement with the audience. So maybe we, rather than going year on year off with team and individual, we can yeah. go individual yeah. influencer, exactly. individual influencer. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't, I, I don't think that that necessarily needs to. I mean, you can get a big following. You can get like what you need to to attract sponsors through performing at a very high level, but. Evidently, you can also get that without performing at a high level. So mm -hmm. I don't think that needs to be someone's like people's concern when they're worrying about taking a year out. Yeah. Especially if you've got decent sponsors who believe in you and they like they trust that you. Yeah. Like, yeah. Perform consistently, but um, uh, yeah, the, the year off, the year off in between could be a great way to fix all those niggles and pains and like mm -hmm. also like give yourself like mentally some time to to reset because to come off of like such a, a high experience like the games. Um, there is a load that comes after that, yeah. and there oh, is yeah. a period of that like recovery that comes after that mm -hmm. mentally as well as physically. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take that, then as we've spoken about, like you do, just you, you feel that burnout afterwards. Yeah. So I always used to, I always used to think like in the years that I didn't qualify for the games, so eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Part of me was always like, right, well, the people that I'm going to be competing against next year for that game spot have to keep training towards the games the people that did qualify for the mm. games like they've got games prep to do and then they've got the games itself and then they've got to take some time off mm. I've got a big head start on them for next year already mm. simply by not qualifying mm. that always used to be a little bit of my internal like motivation as to let's make these three months that I've got to myself to rebuild make them count mm. so that when they return to training I'm at a higher, higher level than mm. they are because they've had to take the time off because they've been battered through games prep, yeah, the games yeah, itself. Yeah. Um, and that's why I felt like I was on catch up in 2016 mm. um, because I then became the person that qualified and had to. And all and those had other people time. that had the time off. Yeah. Yeah. Got one up on you.
Mm. Interesting. Do you think we should, we could push for a um pet, uh, a petition to do a a two yearly games no. with the year in between as the qualification year? No, that would be that's a big ask. <laughs> How about we just start with paying judges? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> if there's less competitions, yeah, yeah, we yeah. might not need. Uh, there might be a bit more money available to pay them. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let them, the Americans listening to us is probably not really something. That happens. <laughs> but we could leave that conversation. Yeah. What? <laughs> what? What is it that still motivates you to keep doing this? Because. Sometimes, it, Jack, I don't, don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Because the, I'm presuming the games was a little bit bittersweet in 2020 because you didn't get the full experience that yeah. you would have liked. Yeah. Which must have been pretty pretty tough, really. Yeah. That was shit. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I can't even... Yeah. It upsets me thinking about it. Yeah. To like you guys know what it takes like to get there and like you know what the like, the amount of time and effort and work and like yeah we love what we do but there's a fair amount of sacrifice you know <laughs> like we're not rolling around in beavers because we because we can do this just the yeah. <laughs> so to to put in all that time and effort and work and also to see previously like a big motivator for that was also going to the games to support Emma in the previous year in 2019 mm -hmm. and like seeing her whole experience from like the moment that we landed there and like you get to. Um, what is it? Was it? Is it? Did we land in Chicago? No, it wouldn't have been Chicago. 2019 was. Yeah, you were, yeah, yeah, Chicago. Chicago. Was it, what was it? Um, well, we, was Madison. Madison. Yeah. yeah. Was it Madison Airport yeah. that we thought the flip with the Emerald Fleet? And you go out there, and they've got all like the big banners up about like 2019 CrossFit yeah, Games, yeah. and like uh, it's like the whole. And you go out to like any like cafe or restaurant you go to has got like a little poster in the window, like the whole city's bought into it. And then going there to like athlete registration and like following through, like her getting all of her kit and everything, and like then like leaving her at the athlete dinner and yeah. uh, then like the, just the, like getting into the warm up area all that stuff let, let alone even like the actual events seeing her experience that and how much like I got a fair amount of satisfaction from it as well like just yeah. seeing her succeed and um, and then watching her perform and be out there on the floor like it just it was just amazing and like, like I could see I could see how she felt that all of the work was had paid off yeah. she'd got this wonderful experience and also it served as a lot of motivation again to to, to yeah. do it again and um, so to see all that and then like that was a great motivator and then spend the following season continuing to put in that work having that in my mind of like i'm gonna i'm gonna get that at the end i mean you're gonna enjoy the process as much as i can but that's yeah. a big motivator and then the reward to be to do like four workouts in the gym that i train in every day with and the, the my, my kit is like four t-shirts and four pairs of shorts yeah. that I had to email for to get the other half because I didn't even send it. Fuck. And then drop out. I think it was it's more so like there was there was more to that build up. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Like then you let on then there was the whole thus the COVID. That was the reason was because of the COVID and yeah the, glass the games being on off the potential isolation when you land there you had to yeah. sort out a hotel that would get gym access special mm. visa pay a few hundred pounds for that visa. Yeah. Spend the time filling it out, then it get changed. Yeah, there was so a lot that of that. was wasted as well. Yeah. yeah, and then there was the Glassman, the Black Lives Matter um, issue. Yeah, which you know um, affected you, affected you as well. Um, there was a lot to deal with in that run up. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, any if anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Yeah, and like the constant on and off of like, it's one thing to prepare for a competition. Um, but to not know if the competition's even on, if you're going to do the competition if it's on, or yeah. where it is, or how it's going to be, yeah. is that, yeah, that was a very disruptive uh, season. Yeah. Mm. How, how do you look at that now? So, obviously, with everything that you just said, with a good, with a better run, do you see it as, like, I've got a better chance here, I've got better preparation, like, going into this season, because those those things aren't you know happening you've not got the worry of covid you've not got the worry of you know the black lives well okay, it's still glassman, that's still ongoing yeah, yeah. but you know what I mean, yeah but yeah yeah, yeah. Like the, the yeah. issue that glassman created with, yeah like his response to that yeah um 
I, I think every season I feel like I'm potentially in a better position to do well for the next season just because of like you, you gain more experience yeah. and more knowledge. You know what how things went for last year, last season. I think that uh, going into this season, the biggest thing has been uh, trying to manage the or like recover from uh, the injury that I sustained or that I like kind of built up through the previous season, which is the reason why I didn't do the open. Um, um, so. And the stuff that I did to help that injury has made me better in some areas, but then that's also had come at a cost in other areas as well. So I don't necessarily, I'm not sure if I necessarily feel like better prepared than I did then, but I definitely, um, it's an experience. It was, an, it, it was a useful experience to have because um, you, it's just like, a, like an experience of dealing with another type of adversity. Yeah. yeah. I think, um if there's any consolation to your 2009, sorry, 2020 oh, games. Yeah, please, please give me it if there is one. <laughs> the best part of my 2015 was qualifying. So the experience of qualifying yeah. rather than the actual yeah. games experience itself. Yeah, it's I think it's a little bit different for Emma because her first year came through, um, it was national champs year, wasn't it? The first time that came. So her qualifying experience was just from doing the Open. No. Was it not? She qualified. <laughs> <laughs> this was the year. Was this two thousand and nineteen? Was nineteen it, strength yeah. and depth? Yeah, she qualified. Oh, she got the spot strength. there. Yeah, did she? she? Got the spot oh right. Yeah, yeah. She got both. Did she not? She got worldwide and she got no. There. Oh right. Oh. No, oh, I don't. I don't know. If she did. She found out like yeah. way after the yeah, event. Yeah, by she email. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. like a finish the event. I've got the yeah, names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, it wasn't that moment. No. Whereas. At least you got to experience that in competition. You crossed, that you was, crossed yeah. the finish line yeah. and knew. Yeah, that like. was that is by far the like the highlight of my like sporting career. Yeah, yeah, that weekend. And f so, from from my perspective, that f from me when when that happened, that was a bigger experience for me than getting the result of going, like the experience of going to the games. Yes, yeah, I understand that, and I think that that's effectively what it's become for me as well. Mm. Because above like any other, above like seeing Emma at the games either time, um, or uh, like any other comp competition like experience, that is like the 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 moment that I think of in my head when I think about like I want to have that that moment again. Yeah. I want to I want to have that feeling again. Yeah, yeah, and then the the game experience is just like a it's almost a byproduct of yeah. Of that feeling, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess it's the, you know, if I potentially then put a top ten finish at the games, that wouldn't be saying the same thing. No, I came twenty sixth. So, but but maybe like without that feeling that you get, for like that motivation, you can't get to that position yeah. at the games. Yeah. But either way, I suppose like if you feel like you've done everything that you could possibly do to be the best that you can, you you're never you're not really gonna. You're not going to leave yeah. with any regrets wherever you finish. Yeah. Going forward, what's your what's your plan for the next couple of years? Like what? Like, is is athlete on the cards for the next follow, two, three, four years? Around being the bag man <laughs> the chef for the next two years. You know, um, find a place. You know, yeah. coaching. Like, what what is it being that you feel like is going to be your your next step after? You know, being a a full time well, pretty much a full time CrossFit athlete, not far off. Yeah, um, I think that I, <laughs> I I always say to Emma like I complain to Emma like oh, I'm getting old, like I can't do anything anymore, I'm too old, <laughs> and she's like, and she just basically tells me it's like I'm, I'm being a little bitch. Yeah, and then, the fuck off. yeah, and then I go watch like, like Jason Smith, who's like 37 years old, like smashing it off at the games. And like numerous other athletes who are like doing Briggs very it. very well, Briggsy, of course, yeah, of course, um, and I think so. That's not it's not like a valid reason or like a doubt to have mm -hmm. for a reason why I, I can't continue to perform. But I would, uh, I don't think I am. I would uh, the athlete think the athlete um, hat is not like it's not off yet. It's not. Off. Because it's, um, I refuse to let my like CrossFit career end, out because of something that I'm not in control of. Mm -hmm. like, I would much rather take the time, however much time and energy and effort and money, whatever it costs, to get my body healthy again, 
and finish the season the way finish my career the way I want to finish mm-hmm. it as opposed to be like forced out because of like a shitty little injury yeah yeah or a shitty little virus a shitty little virus not my sponsor virus Oh, yeah. <laughs> the code, the code, the code they do great, they do great pants, yeah, by the yeah, way. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> My code is... Say it, say it. The, um, but after that, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure yet. I think uh, I'll, it, it will definitely be within the CrossFit space because I love working with athletes and I love helping athletes realise their own potential, especially ones that are like everyone here is so motivated and so driven and so like responsive to feedback. Mm-hmm. It's a very rewarding experience to, to help them get better. Agreed. As it has been with Emma and as it has been with like numerous other athletes as well. Um, so I definitely think I would like to go more into like the coaching side. Emma would like to open up a box. So I will probably be involved in that <laughs> box. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. But we, uh, <laughs> but we, um, and I think that's uh, uh, just because we've worked at so many like so many different boxes. We we know like things that work well and things mm-hmm. that don't. Yeah. And we want to have the opportunity to to do it well. Uh, like, but yeah, to do it right, to do it well. Yeah. yeah. Um, just on my side of things, I was really excited to know that you were coming to Wigan because for these people that we've got here, especially like the the younger ones, like rubbing off on them what like what you will rub off on them i know is just it's just invaluable like alex ferguson when he was you know in his prime at manchester united like he had his older more experienced players and he had his younger players who had like the motivation and the energy and that when that came together like that's when you saw united winning the the treble as an example like having that conversation of the experience and the younger with more energy and, and a bit more spunk yes. <laughs> about them. I feel, I feel like b- without you here in Wigan, there's a gap at the moment. Yeah. Because there's me and Jack, who if we're like more like coach, manager like Alex Ferguson, then there's no senior yeah, athletes. athletes. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to be that senior athlete as well as the, the coach. Mm. And you need those def- and different you roles. Need, yeah, yeah. And I feel like this week, we were, we've only been here, what, it's the third day here. The balance of that is, is here. Yeah. So I've already cancelled your flight back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think it's really important in like a training environment to have that. Like, we've spoke about setting something up previously about teaching athletes, like, we were going to do like that online thing yeah, where an athlete be. could learn, yeah, yeah, like they could learn how to be an athlete because most people, they start CrossFit and they don't have senior players like you do in a football team no. or any other team sport no. that will guide them through, mm. tell them when to eat, what to eat, how to act, how to set up your training session. Every, all the little intricacies around training which make you an elite athlete. They don't have that. Everyone has to learn it from scratch. Yeah. And yeah. If, they, if they've got no one around to learn it, some people might never not reach the potential because they learn it five or six years too late. Yeah, when they've wasted a lot of the time doing the wrong thing. Mm. Mm. Uh, That's one of the one of the good things about CrossFit. Is also one of the bad things in that the the good thing is that you can have access to exactly the same uh, workout as like the the best in the sport. There's not many sports where you like yeah. you can't play basketball. You can't you can't experience what it's like to play LeBron James. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you're playing cross, if you're doing CrossFit, you can do exactly the same workout as Matt Fraser, yeah. and you get a, you instantly get the the a clear gap between you yeah. and like the highest level in the sport. And also because of that, you can essentially get to the highest level in the sport and still be in the same place that you started, yeah. surrounded by the same people. Whereas in most sports, usually as you're ascending those levels, you're also getting exposed to like more le- like higher levels of professionalism. Yeah. Like you're not going to become a pro football player still like yeah. kicking around in your back garden with your dad. Like by the time you get to that level, you're already in that environment with other players. So you yeah. get that what you described. Exactly. Yeah. It's the whole academy process, and yeah, you can learn it just naturally. I think we should probably wrap this up. Just two questions to finish. And I'm going to be honest. I'm, I've st- stealed this first one off the High Performance Podcast. What are the three values that the people around you must buy into? Three values. 
Uh, first of all is uh, accountability. And by accountability, it is, it's the, um, I hold you accountable and you hold me accountable. So if I see, I will would, I would, I would perform to the highest standard that I can and I will help you and I want to help you perform to the highest standard that you can and I want you to do the same for me. So if I see you no rep, if I see you do something in a less efficient way than you could, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you for the purpose of you getting better because if you get better, I get better as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of, so that, uh, I think accountability is mm-hmm. the first one. I'm just going to give you an example of that yesterday when I watched your workout. Did the team workout with a lot of wall walks, box step overs, skiing. It was like, you go, I go, if you and Reggie. And you must, I didn't see the no rep, but you must have no rep to wall walk. Yeah. Um, which no one gave you a no rep at the time. But then Reggie finished the workout or what he thought he'd finished the workout. You kicked best, best kicked Reggie out of the way, <laughs> and you did one more rep, and Reggie was like, "What are you doing?" He was like, "Oh, I did a no rep like five minutes ago or something." Yeah, I think that um, it do, it like that in that situation, like it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. I don't even know what time we got on that work. I can't remember what time we got on that work. Like, no, like no, it's the principle. Like, the, yeah. it's, the, it's the principle. Yeah. So that the accountability thing, and I yeah. think people like if they're if they're doing it for the right reason, they appreciate that. They appreciate someone else yeah. helping them stay accountable because that's going to pay off when it gets to competition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the second point is a little bit. I don't really know what to call it, but I think it's um, uh, it kind of it, it blends with the accountability a little bit, but like a mutual understanding that we are all here to get better and to help each other get better. Mm-hmm. And everything that we do is for the purpose of us getting better. So if I, whatever I say, if I like, if I say that that's a no rep, or if I like suggest to you a way that like, I think that you could do something differently, or like I point out the fact that like, you haven't had, like we've been doing a session for like three hours and you haven't had like any carbs or anything and you're, you're starting to lag. Like everything that I'm saying, I'm saying because I think that those things could help you get better. Like an openness to learn. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not a case of, I've been in situations in the past, like with, on teams and like training with other people where you'll suggest things like that, that you would appreciate if someone were to point out to you, but they take offense to it because they think that you're like attacking them. And so, But I think that can be, that, that response can be removed if you all understand that everything that you're doing, you're doing to help each other get better. Mm-hmm. There's no maliciousness. It's just as if a coach were there saying the same thing. Yeah. Last one. Um, professionalism, like take it seriously. Yeah. yeah. Do your job. You know, like there's a reason why we're here, and there's like a million other things that we could do. Yeah. So if you're gonna do it, like do it properly. Like treat it like it, treat it like a a job, and not in a sense that like you have to turn up and grind like eight till five at this mission board meal. Treat it like a job, like it's professional. Like we did, unfortunately don't have the systems that a lot of sports have where they, as we see downstairs, like yeah. them getting their massages, they're getting the supplements laid out for them. They're like in talk, told what like the warm up and the workout is, but these are not, none of these things are things that you can't like manage yourself. Yeah. Right. So be professional about it. Yeah. Um, because how you, it's how you approach your training and your nutrition and your sleep and everything else, how professional you are is almost like it's respecting your own time as well. And when you finish your career, you'll look back and you'll be happy that you did that and you'll be satisfied. Yeah. Love it. Last one. Uh, one piece of advice to any aspiring CrossFit athletes. Join JST complete. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you, that's, just that's just slipped a tenner across the table. <laughs> first piece of advice. Um, I think the second piece of advice, which is one that I uh, have only really thought about recently, more so because I was previously about like more uh, in terms of like enjoying or finding like value in the process but I think the one that I haven't said so much is um, uh, registering and understanding how much time that you have and that it is not there's no rush to get better it doesn't have to be done now you don't have to get the results now you don't have to PB today it's you you have many potentially many many years in the sport and as long as you are making progress and being like efficient and professional with your training like there's no rush to get better like take your time and like do things right and and get the benefit awesome thanks very much david thank you for having me it was a great conversation it's been an absolute pleasure to have david in wigan at the high performance center 
and also on the podcast to be able to talk to him in a bit more depth. There were so many insights that you all can hopefully take home and apply in your own training and lives. I think he wrapped it up real nicely at the end with his three non-negotiable values of accountability, openness to learn and professionalism. If you enjoyed the podcast, please will you follow, subscribe and share this with others whom you think will benefit. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.